Hi, I'm Dr. Brenda Kazar, and um, we are going to be talking today about gentrification. Um, my connection to the topic is that I'm an urban geographer. I've been looking at issues of inequality in the built landscape for a couple of decades now. And uh, of course, uh, gentrification is part of that research, and so um, that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm Councilmember Kevin Reich. I represent Northeast Minneapolis on the City Council of Minneapolis. Um, I come to the topic uh, by way of my current job, which deals with how we develop as a city. And prior to that, I worked for a community improvement association in Lower Northeast, where community revitalization and issues related to this topic uh, have been ongoing for a couple decades now. Okay, so um, I'm going to actually start by um, talking about uh, gentrification more from an academic perspective. Um, I uh, have been in academia for, for a number of years and um, am now a consultant um, and uh, consult with government, governmental bodies and nonprofit organizations and looking at um, planning issues. Um, and uh, I also uh, wrote uh, the description of gentrification for the Association of American Geographers Encyclopedia with one of my um, uh, comrades uh, at the University of Minnesota. And so I'm going to draw from that to uh, kind of open up the discussion about gentrification. Um, a couple of things that I want to just uh, sort of clarify up front. Um, the first is that um, uh, I think it's imperative that we understand that gentrification is the symptom of a much larger problem. Um, the problem of housing provision in the United States. Um, and um, this problem um, has issues we tend to build to supply rather than demand. Um, we moved away from building starter homes. Um, we were well away from that in the 1970s. Um, and then there's also been an assumption that everybody wants the same type of housing. And um, so we have a little bit of background noise there. but. Um, and then the second thing I just really want to clarify is that the term gentrification itself um, and its associated villains and heroes um, is often not really properly ap applied. And so um, it becomes very confusing for communities to determine what is good in the form of investment um, and what is a threat in the form of displacement um, because it seems that all investment now sort of uh, gets um, scrutinized as to whether it's a harbinger of gentrification or not. Um, so I'm going to take a minute uh, to just uh, read for you um, a brief description of gentrification and then talk a little bit about how um, researchers have looked at the topic. Um, so gentrification is the transformative process whereby lower income and working class households are subjected to higher rents and eventual displacement as higher income households purchase and rehabilitate inner city residences. In similar fashion, lower order businesses are pushed out as the character of the neighborhood changes and commercial space is renovated. From its introduction, uh, gentrification has been a politically charged and less than simple term. Um, and its introduction goes back to uh, a researcher, Ruth Glass, um, out of the UK, who coined the term in the 1960s. She was looking at what was going on in London. Um, and gentrification is associated with the term gentry. And what she was trying to demonstrate is that the high-income landed gentry. Um, she was trying to make this connection between high-income populations that were moving back into the city and the idea of the landed gentry, that they were coming to reclaim their land at the city center, which they had abandoned. Um, so, of course, land at the city center, if we look at historically, um, is associated with um, the landed families that owned um, the land in feudal times and everyone kind of worked on the land surrounding their center. Um, and so this was where she was drawing that idea of gentry and gentrification from. 
Um, and over time, in trying to understand what gentrification means and how it actually, the processes that make it happen, um, urban scholars have looked at the production side, which would be um, the political and economic processes that make markets ripe for gentrification, um, and the consumption side, um, which is the consumers that are actually buying those properties and um, increasing value, um, which then increases rents. Um, and on the production side, we can think of things like policy, um, governmental policy, um, efforts to try and revitalize moribund properties through um, tax credits, tax abatement, um, different things like that. Um, even zoning changes, um, changing industrial to um, make it amenable to residential or other types of commercial use can prompt gentrification. Um, uh, Upzoning, um, allowing for um, uh, higher density of dwellings can um, prompt some gentrification. Um, the economic side, of course, is um, what's available out there on the market um, and decisions that are made on development. So um, maybe continuing to, bel to build and develop larger and larger properties out in the periphery um, uh, that can have a, an impact on the market at the center. On the consumption side, um, you have consumers that are making decisions to be uh, at the center as opposed to moving out to that periphery um, for a number of reasons. Um, uh, it could be that they're looking for affordability as well. Um, so uh, the centers, of course, um, became less desirable. Um, there were also certainly a number of uh, policies and programs that um, limited the movement of low-income populations and especially people of color from being able to purchase properties in the suburban realm. Um, and so um, older neighborhoods um, became sort of this um, space where people kind of got left behind from participating in the great suburban boom after World War II. Um, and um, so uh, there are people that want to come back to the neighborhoods because they're looking at affordability there. Um, those prices have been depressed for a long time. Um, maybe they want shorter commutes. Maybe they work in the city center um, and they want to be closer to work. Um, maybe they want to live in a diverse community um, where not everyone and every property is the same. Um, there's also the historic um, pull of older neighborhoods um, that, that bring seekers back. Um, eventually, once neighborhoods do start to gentrify, you have higher income populations that are drawn to the changes that are actually taking place as more and more high-income people move into the community. Um, but it's, it's been looked at pretty much on those two sides, production and consumption, for most of the history of, of research. Um, and so I think I'll end that little academic description and turn it over to Kevin to talk a little bit more about looking at what's happening in Northeast Minneapolis and uh, a lot of conversations around gentrification in Northeast. So, Yeah, it certainly has become a, a topic and of course uh, our conversation, we were invited by the uh, Eastside Food Cooperative to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. It was a very well attended meeting, which I think is a strong indication of, of the interest in the topic in yeah. general. And much of what you described from an academic perspective or a broad um, perspective uh, is reflected to a certain degree in Northeast Minneapolis as well. Um, much of Northeast Minneapolis was a working class industrial community for uh, new immigrant communities at the time. Um, and it certainly has had that flavor uh, through several generations. Um, there definitely was some depression of values, particularly in uh, lower Northeast or more closer to the river. Um, and that did pre present itself with some affordability. Uh, it certainly, certainly uh, provided some opportunities for our ethnic entrepreneurs on Central Avenue mm -hmm. and our other corridors, uh, commercial corridors. And also, it was a great uh, a combination of affordability and big open spaces that used to have employment and mm -hmm. making things attracted artists who need big spaces to 
make things. And so I think that that pattern and attraction uh, certainly was consistent with Northeast with these little nuances that make Northeast Northeast entrepreneurship and the artistic sort of vitality from the arts community, which has now been formalized in one of the nation's greatest, uh, if, in my opinion, probably the greatest arts district. Uh, certainly a couple of magazines have agreed yeah, with that. Yeah. Uh, but with that, that cultural capital and capital of higher incomes uh, as Northeast turned a corner to become more desirable, we are seeing some of those other patterns. Certainly uh, housing, single family homes, the prices that had slid in value for about 20 years. It was a 20 year slide. Fortunately for Northeast, it wasn't a steep drop like other industrial communities throughout the country, uh, but it still was a very steady decline. Well, now we've had a steady incline and now even a few communities, some spiking of pricing, uh, which has got some people wondering, what will gentrification mean if it really kicks into Northeast Minneapolis like it has in other communities and certainly other cities uh, like a San Francisco, for example. We're not seeing such an extreme pattern in Northeast, but we here like to get on top of an issue <laughs> and figure out what we can do about it. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of uh, what we've done since the 90s with our community reinvestment programs was to actually get some of the investment back to stabilize an aging housing stock that hadn't been invested, to invest in our commercial corridors. Well, now with that success, we have to figure out what investments can stabilize the community in the face of rising prices so as not to have the displacement, be it for individuals who need affordable housing, for the artists who need affordable workspace, uh, or for our uh, individual <laughs> local mom and pop businesses that need a affordable place to open up shop. And so that's sort of the balance we're trying to strike here in Northeast as the pattern has shifted. Yeah. So, I mean, I know, I, I know Brooklyn a little bit because I visit my son and I climb the four stories up to his apartment, which overlooked, before he got rid of it recently, overlooked the Statue of Liberty. And I climbed the stairs because they couldn't put in an elevator because they, you know, they didn't want, they wanted, they didn't want old tenants to stay there. They wanted to be able to gut the thing and triple the rent. But there was rent control on this stuff. Mm -hmm. Is there anything like rent control in Northeast Minneapolis? We don't have rent control, but one of the interesting things, when we were looking for reinvestment, there was a big debate in the late 90s and early 2000s, would affordable housing projects be a part of the mix to revitalize? Some people felt absolutely not, that that would uh, forever uh, cast Northeast as a certain type of neighborhood that would never get any kind of gentrifying or stabilization. Um, However, others said, you know, we've got a lot of polluted land and a lot of undesirable locations that could support affordable housing. And so from that time on, the debate was one that this could be part of a revitalization mix. Interestingly enough, um, and so that's the production of affordable housing, supportive housing, uh, senior housing that can have the kind of rents that allow people to stay in their community. Well, now that we have a highly desirable community and a highly desirable market for um, home sales, that's the same tool we need to stabilize. And so every project that's been north of Broadway, which is much of northeast Minneapolis, has been an affordable housing project. Now closer to downtown, that's where you see the sort of leapfrog over the river of luxury condominiums and luxury apartments. But north of, of Broadway, our response to uh, affordability has been to build a mix of affordable housing. Uh, probably almost a dozen projects in total. And so for us, we don't have rent control, we don't have the legal authority to do that, but we do have the resources within the city with our Affordable Housing Trust Fund to support and underwrite affordable housing as projects. And we're talking about several hundred units have been built to that end. Mm -hmm. So are you talking about apartments that you can only access if your income falls below a certain amount? Is that what you mean by affordable housing? Correct. There will be different, and there's a whole variety of them, all the way from 30% of the metro median income all the way up to about 80% are the range of definitions for affordability. And then also within those categories, special communities, like there's a special uh, affordable housing for artists, seniors, as I've mentioned, and certainly there's been certain apartments that have really attracted new immigrants who are looking for affordable housing in Northeast. So it's a, it's a range of definitions, but they all point to uh, what you state. Um, a rent limit. Okay. And what about this line that is, are you going to have then rent, con essentially, uh, 
rent limited housing on one side of a line and you walk a block and it's then not rent limited and everybody has a name for the other side on each side. Yeah, it's, it's not an official policy, it's just kind of how it's transpired and I think it's based on just an eagerness of some communities to early on invite affordable housing projects that got that inventory and just so happened to be north of Broadway and south of Broadway it's not really a line at this point in time, it's just as you go further south from Broadway, you get to downtown, and downtown's desirability and gentrification has leapt into the southern boundaries of northeast Minneapolis. So it's more a coincidence of um, two dynamics, a vibrant downtown with lots of luxury housing radiating northward, and the fact that we had communities that looked kind of far ahead on the affordability issue and were leaders on it, and that productivity is continuing. Yeah. Although I will say there is south of Broadway, there's already a number of affordable um, housing complexes that exist. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a public housing complex. Um, there's um, um, some Habitat for Humanity townhomes mm -hmm. that were just recently constructed. Mm -hmm. um, there's Teamster Manor, which is a union subsidized uh, patio homes. The email. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, so there, there has been um, affordability built in. That was actually the legacy of the time when the market was in a downward trend. Um, and so what could happen during that time period is the land values had gone down enough to where developers were willing to come in and build affordable housing um, because their profit margins could be higher um, because the land value had come down enough. Um, I think what um, Kevin is talking about is the fact that above Broadway, in addition to communities that are still trying to get ahead of the game on affordability, um, there's also uh, still more affordability as far as land is concerned the further you get away from the river. Mm -hmm. So new development of affordable housing is probably not going to take place closer to the river because of downtown's revitalization which has influenced revitalization closer to the river. But there's already affordable housing in those communities, um, which is good. Mm -hmm. At least that did happen at that particular time. Um, but uh, when you get north of Broadway, another thing that you have, and Kevin alluded to this earlier, is you also have a lot of underdeveloped land um, that was under different types of uses. Maybe some of it was industrial, um, so land that's kind of coming back into the inventory, it's not being used in the way that it was originally used. Um, it has to be remediated and there are now brownfield um, uh, loans available through the city and different uh, lenders and, and at the federal level too um, that can help developers in clearing out that land. And so maybe there's a little bit more land that needs a little bit more massaging um, that's north of Broadway. and so the possibility of actually getting affordable housing developed is still possible. But, but even in there we have a challenge uh, because there's two types of uh, affordability that we want to maintain, not only residential but artists and, and creative adaptive workspace. Mm -hmm. And there's, as markets are better for housing, there is a, a push to convert some of these uh, funky old buildings, uh, not for production, mm -hmm. be it art or the widgets from the 50s, but for uh, homes. And so there you have a challenge if you want to preserve some of the maker space, uh, be it for someone who's making shampoo or beer or a beautiful piece of art, um, that's a different sort of market dynamic as well. And that's where you can manage it through policies such as zoning can play a very key role. Here's an example of how powerful that tool can be. In San Francisco, your average uh, pricing for a typical commercial residential, you can fetch somewhere 80 to $90 a square foot. Uh, certainly numbers that are not present in the Twin no. Cities, but their industrial property is very consistent with ours, anywhere from one to two dollars a square foot. And so you can imagine if they took that policy line out of their industrial properties, the market would just overwhelm it rather instantaneously. We don't have those same uh, dramatic pressures here, but it does uh, put 
the tool uh, in a very clear light. It's a powerful tool if you want to use it to preserve maker space, and I'm certainly very committed to that, and it's certainly a priority of our artist associations mm -hmm. here in Northeast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the, the thing I think I want to get at, and I, I guess this is a question of your personal values, is what is it that you care about preventing or halting or limiting and what is it that you care about promoting? I mean, I, I, just to give you an example to sort of start it off, I mean, I, I live on the edge of Golden Valley in North Minneapolis. And when I walk my dogs, there are two directions I walk them and two directions I wouldn't think of walking them. And, you know, there's a line. <laughs> And I understand the community is having that line, um, and it shapes my whole consciousness. I do not see myself as a member of the community of North Minneapolis. I see myself in, in quite that, in the way in which I might uh, say in Matt Groveland, where I think I wouldn't have a lot of question about which direction to walk my dog. Um, so my question is, what do you want to happen? Leave aside all these, these questions of whether we call it gentrification or what we call it. What do you want it to look like and what is your nightmare about what it could look like? How, how does that go? Well, I, I would have to say that um, I think one of the one of the problems I mentioned before when I said that gentrification is um, often the term is actually misused a lot or thrown around a lot in, in, in ways that don't allow communities to really have a thoughtful conversation about what they want for their future. Um, all neighborhoods want investment. Uh, North Minneapolis Everyone living in North Minneapolis wants investment. They care about their community. Um, we have we have a legacy um, in this country of segregating communities um, by color. Um, a history of redlining, a history of blockbusting, a history of steering. Um, uh, uh, and deed restrictions, which actually there's an interesting map being made of those um, deed restrictions um, that said maybe you couldn't be of um, Asian heritage, you couldn't be African American, you couldn't be a female single head of household, you couldn't be Jewish. There were built right into the deeds and this is a history that um, unfortunately young people seem very unaware of. Um, but this is how these landscapes got created. Um, and I, I bring this up because when I say gentrification is a symptom of a larger problem, this is part of that problem. It's our history of investing in some places and not investing in others. So all communities want investment. Um, we're now, of course, looking at after you know historic preservation made living in historic properties more attainable or, uh, or more attainable I should say and more tenable um, we're looking at this desire um, to live in older communities and and there always was maybe a certain portion of the population that wanted to live in a more diverse landscape but we didn't offer those choices we built suburbia by a certain model over and over and over again um, and so uh, now that there's suddenly a desire to um, bring investment back to those communities that were neglected for so long um, it's with the end result of pushing people that stayed in those communities, that made those communities their home, um, pushing them out because it becomes unaffordable. So um, I guess what I would say to your question of what would I really want to see is um, 
I would hope that we can find a way um, to make sure that there's more affordable housing on a broader scale than we've ever offered that kind of opportunity in the United States. Only about 10% of the housing in the United States is affordable, has some kind of subsidy. Um, I mean, federal public housing is almost gone, um, largely populated by seniors. Um, and uh, so there's, there's very little housing out there that has that affordability built into it. Um, what I think we need to do is we need to be thinking about how do we make more affordable housing? How can we create affordable housing actually in development? So how do we build smaller, more affordable housing? Um, uh, you know, I mentioned before that we stopped building um, starter homes, you know, well into, the, by, the, by the 70s they were long gone. Um, how do we get back to that? How do we get back to building for different household sizes? as opposed to the model, um, you know, two-parent, two-children household, which became sort of the standard. Um, single households are on the rise. It's one of the largest demographic groups. We have all the aging baby boomers. We don't know where they're going to want to live <laughs> as they age. Um, and so thinking about building housing that is much more to demand as opposed to um, to supply. And so in some ways, I guess what, um, what I would look at as, um, you know, what is the end goal or what is the, what is the moral um, outcome um, would be that housing is not built as a market end goal, but actually built as a social end goal. Um, that it's built for people that need it as they need it based on whatever stage in life, whatever income level, that we build housing that's going to be accessible to that entirety. Um, and one of the ways I think that we can do that, coming back around to this idea of investment, is I think political leaders, certainly um, city governments, um, have a role to play in really working with communities to help them find investment that is going to help them improve their neighborhoods but not to a point where they can't stay in their neighborhood anymore. And so that's it's that really blurry line between investment and gentrification, investment and revitalization, um, that line where we tend to cross way too much into that gentrification and revitalization side because um, we're looking more at the development dollars as opposed to is that the right project for this particular community. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and I think that's the, the very moment, that pivotal moment mm -hmm. that Northeast is in. Um, certainly um, the communities uh, west of Central Avenue really strive to get investment. Mm -hmm. um, those were the areas where the, the oldest housing stock, uh, some of the most distressed properties were found, certainly the majority of the pollution from a, you know industrial history, and they worked vigorously to get investment in their communities and are very proud of what they've accomplished. Mm -hmm. uh, they did not want to have two northeast in the sense of yeah. the hill is this great place and stable and this is the area where the crime and the bad housing is. But in that stabilization, now the question is do we lose something if, um, if market forces just completely took over that more communitarian spirit and sense of intentionality that those very revitalization efforts from the city all the way to the community groups had. And I think they're in a good place. They're creating plans that, that want to accommodate, identify, and support and stimulate um, a stable mixed housing stock uh, for those open tracts of land that have that opportunity, particularly where they're closer to our transit because uh, you really can't have affordability if you don't have all the things that right. go to the bottom line. Yeah. Uh, so you look at uh, transit access, amenities. Can you get to your post office? Are there places to buy a, a jug of milk mm -hmm. without having to have your car? Because all that goes to affordability. And even the f uh, current frontier on that question is really about um, environmentalism. Can we have energy efficient 
either a single unit or multi-unit development because that's just one more bill you have to pay mm -hmm. and the less efficient they are the more the consumer or the resident has to pay and so we're now actually merging some of our uh, environmental initiatives into our housing of course there's a cost challenge there but it's one that we're really experimenting with some current project proposals that we have um, so I guess what I'm hoping for um, is that we do not become a victim of our successes but we find we can stabilize and maintain those successes and the measure of that will be can a variety of people and a variety of incomes which is what we have now that's the Northeast we love that diversity are they able to find a home uh, or maintain their homes or if they want to move in in a similar situation find Northeast a welcome and affordable place because we are a traditional place where things were made, can we maintain that history yeah. as well? Uh, again, we have people who have been in this community since the 30s making traditional manufacturing goods like a generator. Very classic stuff, three shifts of people with a great job and a great salary. We don't want them to go away. At the same time, uh, some of these spaces were abandoned and adopted by the artist community, uh, originally informally and now quite formally. So how do we maintain that? Um, and one of the, I think, promising projects on Lowry Avenue is that the artists will actually own the building that they're mm -hmm. developing. That's a smaller scale project but hopefully the, the DNA so to speak can be there for maybe uh, adopting some of the existing legacy buildings uh, when their developers are no longer interested and not just leave it at the whim of the market mm -hmm. but the ownership can be there and a way to do that feasibly and viably is there and then also uh, for those who find the spaces not just for making a product uh, or, or art, but maybe some blending of that, live work. Can we be more flexible with our zoning code? We currently have an industrial living overlay district that mentions it, but I think that can be tweaked in our comp plan to even be more flexible because making jewelry actually up until a few months ago, you couldn't do it unless you were in an industrially zoned property. Mm -hmm. That's just an old fashioned way of thinking about industry and making. That needs to be updated in our comp plan and I'm very committed to working on that as well. So all these tools and incentives, um, as long as you have the intentionality there and the community's committed to that, and I believe leadership in the Northeast Minneapolis is very committed to these challenges. I think we have a moment here where we can make a difference that can be lasting. However, inaction and lack of intentionality, market forces, uh, if, if, um, if other communities similar to ours, like the Brooklyn example, um, if you don't get ahead of it, it will just sort of overwhelm a community and displacement will be an after effect mm -hmm. of that. I truly believe that as well. And that's what I don't want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's, I think it's really important to understand that, you know, market forces aren't something that is just out there. It's not, <laughs> there's no free hand of the market, <laughs> invisible hand of the market, I should say. It's not invisible. We, we know what it is. Um, um, and it, and it really has to do with being able um, to, you know, make maximum profit. Um, and of course, nobody wants property owners not to realize their profits, but, um, you know, there's 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 certain things that we can call into question when, when you know, when the new um, apartment building opens up. I'm thinking Red Twenty, mm -hmm. um, and 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 all of the owners of the older apartment buildings who have not made any improvements are raising their rents because of the invisible hand of the market. You know, is you know, is there a way to work with the community? to make sure that you know there's some comparability there so if something is brand new and it's expensive it it, it shouldn't be this the same as something that's that's old and and as expensive i guess is mm -hmm. you know it would be nice to see some way that we could figure this out um but uh yeah and and bringing bringing people to um the knowledge that that helps them to make decisions as part of a community to where they're going to benefit. Um, you mentioned the, the artists that are actually purchasing a property. Um, Seattle, as an example, has a program and they just created a new position within the city um, that is actually looking at how do you get artists ready to be at the table and talking about redevelopment before the developer comes in with a plan. So, you know, whether it's, you know, gathering artists together and teaching them how to create a co-op, a work co-op of some kind or something like that. Um, and then making the city aware of it so that when that property comes up, um, 
then the developer comes in and says, I'm going to build this. I want to build, you know, a six-story condominium complex with ground floor retail. And the city can say, well, that sounds great. We'd like you to actually talk to this co-op of artists to see if this can be something that we can bring them to the table early on so that we don't end up with 3,500 square feet at retail on the first floor at, you know, tenant build out, triple net, you know, the only thing that can afford to go in there is going to be a Starbucks. Mm -hmm. So um, we just don't really need another <laughs> Starbucks. But I think of Central Avenue and all of the opportunities that are on Central Avenue because the actual built landscape allows for that type of entrepreneurialism. Mm -hmm. um, and that gives a leg up to these different communities um, as opposed to building rebuilding or readapting a landscape that's only amenable to large corporations that are not connected to the community. Um, so yeah, there's all kinds of ways that we have to actually unveil the invisible hand and, um, and, and, and make it a hand that we can we could shake. Yes. <laughs> so that's, that was awful. Yeah. But <laughs> I say, whoa. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, and Central Avenue is a really good example of, of how, uh, again, a community that's very uh, self determined and intentional over the years said this is a place to have opportunity. So the, the, the people who built Central Avenue, the first wave of immigrants, they wanted to have their own shops, oftentimes mm -hmm. with their own language. Mm -hmm. uh, that's commensurate with their own churches and their own pubs. And, and it was sort of a way to um, claim a community within a community. And the, the legacy of that is now, as newer folks have moved into Northeast, they really fell into that pattern where this is this is ours, our thing, and then they share that with the rest of the community. And we celebrate it as diversity, but for them, it's hey, it's a way for us to have a foothold in the American dream. Right. And so, how do you preserve that? Uh, again, you support those businesses, uh, the city, of course, to accommodate uh, the kind of formula or big box businesses. It takes a lot. They're formula businesses. They need to have a certain sort of land amount. Mm -hmm. They need to have a certain type of building quality. They need to have a certain amount of parking ratio. And if you yield and give them or even stimulate that sort of development, you will lose right. the small entrepreneurial spirit. However, if you keep the C1, the very low intensity zoning, and if you keep um, the parking ratios very small, the small businesses because they rely so much not on a formula and a car-centric sort of business model, but a community support model, um, where during the week the neighbors kind of uh, enjoy it, be it a pub or a restaurant, and the weekend because it's a cool neighborhood with a lot of character, it draws in a lot of attractions. That's the kind of businesses that make Northeast Northeast. As long as we don't change the zoning code on them and entice a different business model, they will have uh, the advantage because they can make it work in the unformulaic landscape of right. the Central Avenue. Right. And then you mentioned the skill sets. Uh, we, of course, have had a, a small business department in Minneapolis, and we really ramped it up uh, to a certain degree, and we created the small business, the BTAB, Technical Assistance Program. And in doing that, we noticed that there's niche businesses that have a different set of challenges and a different sort of set of needs for technical assistance. Mm -hmm. So we just unleashed the cooperative, the CTAP, Cooperative Technical Assistance Program, for that model. A, to educate the public that it's not just for grocery stores. Mm -hmm. uh, it's for any type of business you can imagine. And Northeast has several. Uh, we have a cooperative brewer. We have a cooperative coffee shop. We have a cooperative climbing club. I mean, we have a cooperative tool um, you know, company. Yeah, I mean, this is a really interesting model, and it's supported small businesses. And we are, just because we love acronyms, we are doing an ATAP, which just is exactly what we're talking about. Technical assistance for uh, artists who might not yeah, and be... creatives, yeah. That might not be developers or have those skills, but certainly that's a transferable thing. It's not like you're born to be a developer. Um, you, these are skills that can be transferred. Uh, and, and if not transferred, certainly that sort of a joint and parallel assistance could be granted to them in addition to maybe small stimulus to redevelop underutilized properties for, to their ends. Mm -hmm. And so with the ATAP, the BTAP, and the CTAP, we think we're going to have a really great package to support the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit that's so alive in Northeast. Of course, they're available to other people in Minneapolis, right. <laughs> but, but boy, Northeast has really taken advantage of them to date. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. I spent a lot of time wandering around uh, 
almost totally vacant malls in St. Paul, uh, you know, spaces that were introduced with great hope that were now quite dangerous ghost towns. And it, it makes it clear to me that if a, thing, if, a, if a business is large enough, it can make money by closing a store. Mm -hmm. And if a conglomerate is long, large enough, it can make money by a, business go, a, a part of its business going bankrupt. <laughs> I mean, it's, cal it's calculated. Whereas the Chinese restaurant that hangs on with three, ca three customers a night mm -hmm. is, you know, the, the commitment's absolute. You know, we close, we close this thing when we die. Um, and someplace in between those, there's a lot of businesses, but in, with, with a certain kind of small thing, the owner's all in. And we see all over the place the wreckage of owners being very much less than all in mm -hmm. to places. Mm -hmm. Of course, they have massive amounts of money, both for lobbying and as enticement to the community. Okay. And that must be a really strange thing as, as a political leader to make sense of that or balance that. You know that, you know, I have to talk to 35 or 40 small business people and work them through an incredible amount of steps to get to the point where they're paying the taxes and bringing in the people that one bound to be read would bring in. Mm. And yet, bound to be read will leave if its profit margin falls beyond, below a certain point. I think. At least that I've seen it occasionally. Mm. So I'm wondering how you, how you think about that or how you how you make sense of that as, a, as an elected official interested in sort of the welfare of an area? Well, the way I look at it, uh, you know, it's not just nostalgia that brings me to, you know, the small is beautiful, the Schumacher Society <laughs> sensibility. Um, I just know that that's just how Northeast has always thrived and how that's just been a gateway of opportunity. So it's what I inherit. Uh, it's the community I grew up in, and that's just what I think makes Northeast Northeast. So that's a personal angle on it. But a government angle on it would be, you know, if, if, if a corporation or conglomerate that has that much capacity, government does not need to be there whatsoever. Uh, there is no market failure or market weakness in that instance. They have the assets that they need to do what they need to do where they need to do it, and government can either get in the way of their activities be it through regulation or, in my mind, just, you know, leave it alone. However, if we value a certain type of uh, uh, small business environment, and that is a lower margin, as you suggest, uh, a much more risky environment, uh, high rate of failure in terms of restaurants opening and closing, the failure rate's rather high. Uh, knowing that, that suggests that there is a market weakness, if not market failure in some instances, and that's where government should be invited to intervene with the consent of the community if that's what they value. Mm -hmm. And so for me, uh, there's a kind of a clear sort of philosophical guidance to where we put our efforts and where we don't and then a personal bias in terms of the community that I grew up in, preserving it, not in a museum sense. Northeast has been a very successful community because it reinvents itself, but with a certain pattern that gears toward the small, the entrepreneurial, the family, um, and certainly the um, success rate of Northeast in that broad stroke is un undeniable. We have reinvented ourselves over decades as the kind of community that has that small town feel, very much you go, uh, once you get a little distance from the downtown core, you don't see a Starbucks in Northeast Minneapolis. You mm -hmm. see about, you know, eight independently run people who live in the neighborhood, they walk yeah. to work, kind of coffee shops, uh, and I can give many examples, that's just one. So you, you preserve what you value, you interact with what you value, and philosophically, if there's not a market failure or a market distress, you just don't need to engage in that type of uh, intervention. Yeah. And really, I mean, if you think about commercial, especially retail, um, there, uh, it, it didn't just happen. I mean, there has been certainly an evolution that is tied to the production of things that has reshaped the way that we've retailed. Um, and so uh, 
you know, our expectations have, have changed as, as products become available, that's part of it. In some of that, you can kind of follow along that um, the built landscape then follows whatever that model is. Um, but there's certainly many instances where, um, you know, government has facilitated um, the, the types of development. So malls, as an example, or the big box retail, um, without depreciation at the federal level for, for corporate properties, we, we wouldn't see the massive openings that we do where, you know, Walmart went and, you know, opened up however many thousands or tens of thousands of stores across the country, you know, put out um, businesses in the surrounding four communities or five communities surrounding them on Main Street, um, and then picked up and, and left. Um, you know, they were able to do that because financially there were tools in place that enabled that. And so the idea of land banking or, um, you know, overdevelopment, you know, sometimes that's facilitated by regulations that we put into place that make it amenable for businesses to do that. So it's, part of it is yes, they have the money, they have the lobbying, but that lobbying then also tends to bring them some tools that, you know, combine to, to, to make it, um, you know, quite, quite pleasurable for them to be able to do that. Um, so, you know, what we, I think what we sometimes fail to do is we fail to look at the way the built landscape is facilitated in many ways at many different levels, federal, state, county, um, local municipality um, by certain financial and regulatory tools that um, help uh, some and, and, and not necessarily help others. So um, I think I just it's I think it's important to kind of keep that in mind. And there's no clear example of governmental um, um, investment that supported one type of business model over another than the freeway system. Yeah. You, you take that out of the equation, you do not have a certain uh, formula big box model that mm -hmm. was absolutely dependent on... No malls. Yeah, just, it just, <laughs> it, it, they just wouldn't be viable, mm -hmm. they wouldn't exist, and so that was a, you know, probably still to this day the most, you know, massive public investment in the history of mankind right. uh, post-World War II. Which also got rid of a huge huge, huge, huge number of housing units um, that would have remained more uh, organically affordable over time, um, split up communities, often communities of color. So yeah, the freeway system had a huge impact on commercial and residential outcomes that we look at today. So in some ways, what's um, I think kind of interesting when we talk about housing uh, when we're talking about gentrification, we're talking about inaffordability and the need for affordable housing, um, at some point we're all kind of fighting over the crumbs in a way. Um, we're, we're fighting over this small little bit of housing stock that is either organically affordable or subsidized in some way to be affordable. And I think that we have gentrification today um, we're looking at this issue of gentrification because we don't really want to acknowledge that we have a larger portion of the population that is now fighting over that smaller bit of the market. And I think it's true with, with retail spaces and, um, you know, the entrepreneurs, they're also in, in many ways fighting over a smaller bit of stock that's still available. Um, and we're not we're not building new stock to replace it and so the more and more of that goes out big swath of it went out during the freeway development and especially during when they under urban renewal fun, funneled a lot of money into building bypass routes that went through neighborhoods and destroyed a lot of small commercial space, those corner stores that you see in mm -hmm. in Minneapolis, those four corners that have retail on them. Try and find that in cities throughout the country. It's it's really rare. Um, 
And so we've gotten rid of those kinds of commercial opportunities for people to start their own businesses and then a lot of that affordable housing stock. Um, to the point where um, when we're talking about gentrification today and we're talking about higher income people coming in and fixing up properties and oftentimes bulking out properties, this is a big conversation mm -hmm. in Edina, but it's true in Minneapolis as well and some of the places in South Minneapolis. Um, what, we're, what we're really concerned about, I think, but isn't vocalized as much, is that we're, we're taking more of that smaller housing stock out of the market. And that smaller housing stock is tomorrow's affordability. Um, so, yeah, we're, we have a pretty uneven uh, stock as far as our inventory of different ranges of pricing of housing, sizes of housing, and then I think a larger portion of the population needing to be in that category where the stock is much smaller. I wanted to ask about this category of organically affordable housing. I think I know intuitively what that means. When I came to the University of Minnesota in 1974, I moved in above the Little Haven Nursery School. There were six rooms there uh, with a common kitchen. After a while, I got tired of the common kitchen and and cut my rent $5 from $55 a month to $50 a month, moving into the fourth floor of something that had been owned by Alexander Ramsey at one point, hmm. had no air conditioning, possibly had never been cleaned, and had pigeons in the walls. I mean, they cooed. The house cooed. And I survived. And the people I met down the road, you know, the people on either side of the Little Haven, we're living in things like that, and they survived. I don't. Ma I imagine some fire inspector got rich, uh, not condemning some of these houses because they looked like they desperately needed uh, some stern warnings about numbers of things. But here's my question. I mean, you know, as one up grades and makes things uh, spiffier, each of those regulations that make them spiffier also add a burden and pretty soon, <laughs> the, you know, Alexander Ramsey's organically affordable $50 a month <laughs> apartment is no more. Uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a half, a little bit of an investor in a bar in, in Queens, and I know what it took to get that thing open. The number of all of the things that had to be done to meet city codes. So how's it looking here? I mean, for for keeping organically affordable things, <laughs> organically affordable in the, in, I mean, just in the sense that properties that are in fact things one can live in don't get don't get sort of coded out of existence well um, you know the term organic is sort of a term of art more than yeah in fact it's kind of like the invisible hand in a way <laughs> um, uh, it's a, a fiction that points to a, a, a truth in conversation more than anything else but in but to your point um, yeah we certainly don't want to have affordability mean unsafe uh, no. habitat. We want, <laughs> we want to make sure that safety is yeah. a big part of it. And of course when a place is affordable uh, it's because you know demographic trends, you know people moving out of the center and going out, uh, depressed values, a uh, community that may have uh, had a reputation, be, be it its crime rate or something, might depress values. An individual apartment or home could be depressed because of lack of um, upkeep. Uh, but all, all those things can be reversed too. You can have a community become desirable again. Demographic trends are very clear that the center is attractive, not just in Minneapolis but other communities as well. And so the reversal of what might have made it organically affordable is already uh, upon us. We we certainly do enforce our codes in Minneapolis. Uh, community groups are, were given lots of money to stabilize, overtly stabilize their housing stock, and they targeted the homes that needed it the most. Um, and so, so those things are in play. The question is, um, then what happens when the inventory 
of what was affordable based on these other dynamics, then what do you do? Mm -hmm. And obviously rent control is a, a tool that is used in some communities. Uh, it's not statutorily enabled here. Um, and even there you have a limit to how much of the inventory you're actually preserving and are you picking winners and losers through that sort of lottery process literally winners and losers. So uh, the tools that we, we really employ very robustly here in Minneapolis um, is to just get those production of units for a diverse sort of income and population needs and just don't look back uh, in terms of our commitment. Right now we try to do 300 or so units a year. We're probably going to have to up that mm -hmm. uh, given that inventory is starting to slip mm -hmm. away from us faster than we're building. And that's the great challenge that we have. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I've actually never really thought of affordable or organically affordable as meaning that it has to be in such disrepair that it's affordable. Um, I think that's that's also again something that um, you know I think it's safe to say that when cities are doing their budgets, um, their regulatory uh, enforcement end of the uh, funding stream dies out a little bit. Um, I think a lot of cities really have struggled with that, bringing that back into a robust enforcement um, uh, uh, strength because of uh, the downturn in the market, property taxes um, really reduced a lot of city budgets um, pretty dramatically. Um, and there's been a lot of catch up to that. Um, and then, of course, the desire of not having your property taxes go up too much. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a fine balance, I will say. Um, but enforcement, I think, is one of the keys, um, you know, to, to keeping what could be relatively affordable properties in decent shape so that people can have a good quality of life. Um, I think one of the you know issues that many places had, many cities throughout the country had when, um, you know the 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 inner what they were called inner city neighborhoods, but they were really first suburbs. But that's a whole nother conversation <laughs> if we get that historically correct. Um, but you know a lot of those um, places were absentee landlords, and there wasn't a whole lot of enforcement. Um, put in place for them to keep their properties up and you know they were land banking they were waiting for the property values to come up so they could un finally unload those properties and so there wasn't a whole lot of of care and concern or effort put into that um, I used to always say to my students um, you know it renters aren't the problem it's the it's the landowners um, renters aren't the ones that should be painting the house or you know keeping the landscaping and that type of it should be the it should be the, the landowner but we don't tend to um, cite the landowner but I do also want to say I think it's really important to look at our history the catching up that you you know indicated you know 300 units we need to increase that um, you know, a lot of that is really that you know we've, we've stopped I mentioned starter homes but even like the, the first tier that 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 move in, that first step up, you know, that type of housing isn't being built. Um, we kind of went from building single family homes, um, row homes, um, four, four floor walk ups, um, to building large single family homes, and the alternative was the apartment, which you weren't expected to stay in, um, and then uh, condominiums were put in as the the next tier of affordability but that was a false form of affordability because condominiums you know when you figure in homeowners associations and and having to maintain the entire building isn't always affordable um, so there's um, we, we've uh, a big part of, of, of getting rid of that starter, the next step up, and just kind of uh, building only the the larger level when you should be in your second or third move up um, is the fact that now we're catching up. And so that's that's gonna that's gonna take a long time to come to and we, we really also fight against that because people don't want denser neighborhoods. They don't want density in their communities and so that gets into a whole nother whole nother concern and so trying to right 
our historic wrongs is a, is a bit of a problem. Um, yeah, and doing a lot of catch up. 